What are the steps on buying your first rental property? And what are the pitfalls that you should be looking out for? These, there's some of the questions that we're going to tackle in today's video. But first, hi, I'm Jeff Chubb. And I'm a retired investment banker turned real estate agent, and I've sold more than a thousand houses. And I'm Sam Iliopoulos with Guaranteed Rate and one of the top loan officers in the United States. All right, Jeff. So what are the first steps when it comes to buying a rental property? Okay, so step one, it's defining your investment goals. You need to know what success looks like. So that way, well, we can find it. Then you can act. So what are some of the things that a potential investor should be thinking about when defining their investment goals? Great question. Defining these goals could be clarity on what type of investment that this is going to be. Is this one that you're looking to be more of a passive investment or that you're looking to roll up your sleeves and get dirty? Another major part of defining your goals is determining what would be an acceptable return on that investment. That makes a lot of sense. So what does an acceptable return look like? So, well, that's really different for everyone. And there really isn't a wrong answer on this one, except for maybe a negative cash flow property, which we're going to talk about shortly. Sammy, what's step two? Step two would be to save it for the down payment. Buying an investment property is a little bit more challenging than buying just the first home. How so? Uh, well, generally speaking, if you want favorable financing with the lowest interest rate, then you'll need to put down 25%. And even then, it's important to remember that the interest rates will be higher than the rate for a primary home that you're going to be buying to live in. Okay, so how big of a premium are we actually talking about here? Depends on the day and depends on the mood of the market, <laughs> uh, but upwards to half a point. Remember that it is impossible to buy an investment property with a smaller down payment. It's just that the terms won't be as favorable. Okay. So now leads us to step three, which is taking steps to actually qualify for a loan. Sammy, why don't you walk us through this one? The steps to qualify for a loan when buying an investment property are similar to one, but when, when you're buying a first home, um, you're going to get the best interest rate if your credit score is above 740. Uh, you'll need two years of tax returns, the last two, three months of bank statements. W-2s as well as pay stubs. Sorry, but I just want to chime in here and have to say that you also want to make sure that you're looking at what you're going to be sending over. Banks will look at the last two or three months of bank statements and we'll go over this with a fine tooth comb. Don't have any big deposits here that you can't really explain. I think you're talking about seasoning. Yes, you are right. Let's say, for example, that your parents are going to give you uh, money towards a down payment. Giving the money a statement before your loan officer needs it, and then that means that the money would be seasoned and there would be no additional scrutiny from the bank set. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was talking about. And real quick, my shameless plug, if you're thinking about buying or selling a house, then reach out to Sammy and I. We'd love to help you. Now, Sammy, why don't you talk to us about getting pre-approved for a loan, which would be step four. So the pre-approval process is relatively easy if you have taken the time to prepare. And we make it even easier with an online portal where you upload all your documents. Uh, and I always recommend people to go through the pre-approval process before looking at houses. Sometimes some surprises may come up here and then the budget will be less than what someone might have expected. I, I think that's a really, really great point. Always get your pre-approval first as it will help you be grounded with the prospective investment properties that are in your price range. So what else should a potential investor consider during that pre-approval process? Well, uh, they'll be most likely want to keep your investments as a single to four family property. Uh, this is because five plus units will require commercial financing, which is more expensive and harder to obtain. Anything else? Uh, yes. Uh, stay current. <laughs> Don't miss any payments. Stay diligent on your credit. Uh, one late payment could be a, you know, a really bad case scenario for your borrowing costs and it'll, it'll be higher. And worst case scenario, jeopardize your ability to buy a house today and push that time frame out to six plus months. Okay. Uh, step five is to also identify the type of property. Jeff, what can you tell us about this? I think some great advice when you're buying your first property is to buy something within an hour radius of your current house. The reason being is that you will likely have some good insight on these areas, like what you consider as a good area, bad area, or high crime areas, or maybe an area with good or bad schools. Could agree more. As a first investment, it's always better to be safe. Otherwise, you could end up really being sorry. I'd, I'd also recommend that someone think in the terms of average. Average means something different to everyone and everyone else. As a great example, the average in our market is that $500,000 ballpark for a single family home. That's a luxury property in a lot of other markets around the country. Total sense. There's a risk to a potential investor on both sides of the spectrum going to be a high end as well as going for the lowest price points. Exactly. There's always safety in averages. And you're also going to want to consider which market segment you're looking for. And there are positive and negatives to all of them, quite frankly. Like what? Well, as an example, a condo will have a condo fee, and it can eat into a lot of your margin depending on what that condo fee is. Plus, you're at the will of the condo association in regards to it going up or even them leveling a special assessment at you. But with the condo association, there's a lot less management of that property. 
Single family properties are great because there's a lot more of a supply when it comes to those properties, but there's also a lot more upkeep. Upkeep comes at a cost. Multifamily properties can be an amazing investment, but get ready for a lot of upkeep plus dealing with multiple tenant issues under the same roof. And multifamily properties, well, they come at a premium. And don't forget the investor limits that can oftentimes be put to condo associations. But I think the most important thing when finding a property is about finding a positive cash flow property. And I couldn't agree more with you. And that has become more challenging in this environment with higher rates and low inventory levels. Sammy, let's walk through this a little bit. First thing you'll want to do is get an estimate on the loan payment for the property. You'll then want to add in taxes, property insurance, homeowners fees, utilities, and the vacancy rate. There's a lot there. So let's break all of this down. Yeah, let's say the rental property that you're interested in is 500,000. This means that a 25% down payment, the down payment would be about 125,000. Let's just use a 7.5% interest rate today, which would be really favorable. Uh, keep in mind that when you watch this video, that interest rates could be up or down. We're using the mortgage calculator at mortgagenewsdaily.com, which is a pretty awesome tool. So let's add $1,800 for property insurance and $4,500 for the taxes. And this brings us to the payment of about $3,147 per month. We really should add in the vacancy reserve cost as well. Yeah, first talk about uh, what a vacancy reserve is. Sure. The vacancy reserve is a calculation based on how long the property would be vacant for in, in a given year and applying that expense to the monthly expenses. So if a property was vacant for one month each year, then the vacancy reserve would be 10% of the collected rent roll. Correct me if I'm wrong, but most people use a 5% vacancy reserve rate. Yeah, that is correct. 5% of the monthly revenues. So now that we have a hold of our expenses, then we need to get an estimate of what type of rent a property would receive. And Zillow has some great estimates for what property rents would be. You can also search their database for current rentals and get an idea of some of the comps. Let's say the investment property would run out for $3,700 per month. This means we would want to take the $3,700 and subtract the principal interest taxes and payment of $3,147. Plus the vacancy reserve of $185 a month then add in water and sewer and maybe lawn care as an example. Let's say that's $100 per month. So that is a grand total of $3,432 per month in expenses, which means the net would be $268 or a cash on cash return of 2.6%. Well, that doesn't sound great, quite frankly. Yeah, so the surface, that isn't a great return, but you're paying down the principal on the loan each month. You should be adding that back in. That's a great point. In year one, the principal pay down is $3,457. Adding that into the equation, then that would mean that your ROI would be 5.5%. And that is in year one. Rent roll should grow with rental rates increasing while you start paying down more and more principal each year. There was a lot with step six. Let's talk about buying a home in need of some minor repairs as step seven. I think the key word here is minor repairs. Yes. You do not want overly complicated for your first investment. Stay away from development projects and entire house flips. If you see a house and it needs some flooring and paint, then I'd say you're on the right track. Exactly. Stay away from the roof or system upgrades if you can. Even kitchens, a full kitchen gut can cost you an arm and a leg. Step eight is uh, finding a real estate agent. Jeff, do you have any thoughts on this one? <laughs> yeah, I got some thoughts on this one. You want to choose an agent that is experienced, but not just experienced in sales. You want someone who understands the investment world. Do they know what a cap rate is? Do they know how to calculate a cash on cash return? Can they look at a property and provide suggestions on ways to improve the investment to provide a greater return? I would also probably throw in that you probably want an agent who does some investing themselves, uh, essentially making sure that they're putting their own money where their mouth is. Yes, I always get some amusement from agents who rent but tell other people that buying a house is one of the most important things that they can do. Yeah. Basically, you're saying that you want to interview your agent and not just start working with the first person who opens a door. Great way to sum it up. And step nine is to write offers and be patient. Yeah, this process may take a little longer than you hoped or planned. It's as simple as the numbers work or they don't. Don't stretch. It makes no sense to have an investment property where you lose money every month. Stay honest to your calculations as well as your process. Uh, one thing that I learned over the years with all the investors that I've worked with is that when you are investing, you often need to kick over more rocks, be selective and find the right investment. When it all comes together, then that is when it brings us to step 10. Step 10 is the offer getting accepted and doing all the agreed upon inspection. Now, many times investors will write an offer that is non-contingent on a home inspection. As a new investor, don't do that. Uh, unless, of course, you have had a pre-inspection done. Yes, unless you've done a pre-inspection. It doesn't take much of a repair to turn an investment, quite frankly, upside down. 
Yeah, as a uh, first investment, you'll have to start putting together a trusted team. You definitely want a good inspector to be on the team, not an alarmist of an inspector, but someone who can be frank with you and tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And that leads us to step 11 in the buying process, which is preparing for the closing. Sammy, talk to us about closing costs. Closing costs on the property are gonna range between one and a half to 2% range of the purchase price. What are some examples of closing costs that we pay at closing? Yeah, uh, so you have some lender fees, uh, title recording fees, title insurance is a big one. Another big one is insuring the property. And some states have a transfer tax that the buyer is responsible for part of. The seller pays transfer tax here in Massachusetts, but it can cost you a pretty penny in other states. Another thing that you hopefully have already thought of is how you're going to take title on the property. With it being an investment property, then you may want an LLC to hold the property. If that is the case, then you will want to ensure that the LLC is set up before closing. Uh, that leads us to step 12, which is making any improvements to the property. As we mentioned earlier, if this is your first rental property, then you may want to consider keeping the renovations on the light side. Think, think paint, flooring, um, minor touch-ups. And if they are things that you can personally do, then that's even better. It will increase your return. Also remember that time is of the essence. The longer it takes you to do the improvements and the longer it takes you to rent the, the property and start generating a revenue. And generating revenue, it's our entire goal of this process, right? And that leads us to step 13 when buying investor property. You will need to get the property rented out. Uh, when renting out a property, then I highly recommend hiring a real estate agent. Yes, for their general knowledge and pricing a property, but also for the liability standpoint. Yes, us agents, we have what's called errors and emissions insurance. Landlords, they do not. An agent will help with pricing the tenant screening and everything in between. And here's the best part. In most cases, the tenant actually pays for the broker fee. In other words, in most cases, it doesn't cost you anything. Now, the consideration is hiring a property management company. But keep in mind that this could cost you 5 to 10% of the rent roll. In most cases, I don't think it makes sense as you start the investment journey to have a property manager. A 5 to 10% is an important part of your margin in order to help you grow your investment empire. 100% agree, but I think it's just important to know about this as an option. And then there's a step 14. Yes, step 14, it's a good one. Save up for the next investment property. Yes, rinse and repeat. Real estate is a long-term play in becoming wealthy. You know, Sammy, I heard a great quote the other day. It was something along the lines of that being wealthy is when your investments make more than your expenses. That's a great quote and an even more amazing mindset. Ultimately, real estate is the key to building generational wealth. And like with all great journeys, it all starts with that first step. If you're thinking about buying your first investment property, then reach out as it would be a pleasure to talk. Yes, I only work in Massachusetts, but have very qualified associates all around the country that can help you find the perfect investment property. And I can help you in going over your financing uh, options, whether you're looking to buy in Massachusetts, California, and everywhere in between. And that's a great point, as it wasn't so long ago that you actually helped my brother buy his investment property down in Florida. Yeah. You can also reach me at youtuberealestateagent.com and can find all of our information in the description below. Until next time.